Well, I'm back. And uh, Pastor Eric and his wife are on vacation, and uh, so we want to be praying for them, and he'll be back next Sunday. And uh, so today I get a chance uh, about once or twice a year to kind of knock the rust off, you might say, and uh, begin to go ahead and share with us. So today when we take a look at our sermon, we're going to be taking a look at four men that wrestled with God's truth. And our sermon today is about truth. Uh, And I always like to go and take a uh, special uh, key verse, and that comes from James 1, 22, which says, uh, do not uh, merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Also, I'd like to mention that uh, I always like to have that question and answer sheet, so if you kind of like to do that, you can go ahead and begin to fill in the blanks, and that will you can take that home with you and maybe share it with someone else. I'd like to begin telling the story about a, uh, a young lady who was very, very excited. She had a new boyfriend, and he had promised to take her to a uh, uh, a romantic, it was going to be a romantic date uh, and to uh, upscale restaurant and she was really excited and he was to pick her up at 7 o'clock at night. <clears throat> she was very disappointed when he didn't show. She waited, she waited, she waited and, and finally uh, she decided, you know, uh, I went stood up and so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get ready for bed. And so she took off her makeup, she put on pajamas, her robe, she put rollers in her hair. At 9.30, the boyfriend shows up. He takes one look at her and he says, you mean to tell me that I'm two and a half hours late and you're still not ready? The truth is, here is a young man who's about to experience a world of hurt you're going to hear me say uh, these three words again and again. And that is, the truth is, because I believe that we're in a truth famine. And I look today and trying to find the truth, and it just seems like the truth is evading us. Uh, it, it seems like fake news has come to the front and center of the media stage, and sometimes uh, we see that uh, people lie to us. Uh, sometimes uh, they uh, go ahead and hide the truth. Uh, sometimes we see a conspiracy that's uh, uh, around, and we realize and understand uh, that we just wonder, no, where is the truth? Uh, This week on my phone, on my caller ID, one said spam risk, and the other one said probably a fraud. Uh, Where do we go to find the truth? Uh, And I know that I can go one place to find the truth. One place, and that is right here, the Word of God. Because this is the truth of God. And this is truth that comes from heaven. And so if I ever want to know the truth, at least I can go right here and begin to read the Word of God. And it can help me to understand the ways of life. So Christians have been searching for the Word of God. And so now we come to the scripture of James 1, 22 and 25. And it says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently upon the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this Uh, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, uh, he will be blessed in what he does. Uh, This is God's truth. Uh, It is truth from heaven. And Jesus often said and realized uh, that false and fake news was going on in Jesus' time. And that was coming from the religious rulers of the day. And they had changed God's laws and and, uh, and burdened people with uh, the ways in which that they were working. So often, I was amazed one day when I was reading and it said, Jesus would say before he spoke, this is a truthful saying. And then he would go ahead and he said, this is a truthful saying. He may do a parable or whatever, but he would begin by saying, this is a truthful saying. In scripture, we hear the words, the truth shall set you free. And in John 4, 24, it says, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Uh, Then we we go to, (coughs) excuse me, the book of Revelation, 
And John tells us and gives us a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like in the 21st and the 22nd chapter. And he tells us that sin shall be no more. Death shall be no more. And uh, he tells us that we will not be struggling and have pain. And pictures paints a wonderful picture of what heaven is like. And says the words, these words are trustworthy and true. Notice how the words trustworthy and true go together. The truth down through history, we have seen that mankind has struggled and wrestled with the truth. People have tried to deny the truth, cover up the truth, pretend it doesn't exist, and we soon learn that we get in a lot of trouble when we misrepresent the truth. Even in the Bible, we see that there were men who were wrestling with God's truth. And uh, we see this, uh, and so today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at four men that were wrestling with God's truth, uh, and in this we're going to learn and possibly understand some lessons of how that we can know what is the truth uh, and maybe avoid some of the mistakes that they made. The first one is that we go to Jonah, and the truth is there is no escape from God. We're familiar with the story of Jonah. Jonah was just kind of enjoying himself uh, during the time and the day, and, and all of a sudden, it was, Wah! the Lord spoke to Jonah. And uh, this is what he said. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because the, uh, its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarshish to flee from the Lord. We all know that uh, God had a mission for Jonah to accomplish, and we realize and understand that Jonah wanted no part of it. These were wicked people. They might stone him. They might uh, beat him up. Uh, they might kill him. And after all, this was an enemy of Israel. He certainly didn't want to save them. Jonah wanted no part from this. He wanted to hide from God. He wanted to escape from God. We all know the story, the great storm that came, and finally Jonah was thrown over. And it's interesting when you read the book of Jonah, how that the seaweed went around his neck, and how that he saw the mountains. So he was at the very bottom, and I'm sure that he was about out of the breath, and that's when the whale snatched him. He was inside the belly of the whale, and God had him right where he wanted him. You cannot hide from God. God is everywhere. Also, we must realize that when God wants us to do something, that we must be willing to surrender to his truth. Today, there's a lot of people that are trying to run away from God. They don't understand that uh, God, when you were born, he puts a spiritual GPS on you. And guess what? He always knows where you are. No matter if you go to the deepest cave, the deepest ocean, you go out there to a different galaxy, God always knows where you are. As a matter of fact, God knows everything about you. He knows how many days you've been on this earth, how many seconds you've been on the earth, how many hairs you have in your earth on your head, some of us more than others, uh, and uh, he even knows how much we weigh, he knows everything about us, uh, and uh, he knows all about you, he knows where you are, who you are, what you're doing, and what you're thinking, isn't that great? You cannot hide from God. When I was in ministering in a church in Washington, Indiana, I read the story about a man who uh, was trying to run away from the police. He had stolen uh, a truck, and he got in an accident, and he was by a bridge, and it was kind of night, and the sun had set, and it was dark, and he ran into this cornfield. The corn was really tall, and he says, they'll never find me. I am safe. And all of a sudden, he heard this noise and whatever, and he didn't look up, and it was a helicopter, and the light shone right on him. There was no place to hide. There was no escape, uh, and he was arrested. 
The truth is, you cannot escape from God. But my, my question is, as a Christian, why would I want to escape from God? God is my heavenly Father. Jesus is my Savior, my Lord. Holy Spirit is my God. Scripture is my compass. I want to have a relationship with God. I want to get as close to God as I possibly can. But guess what? There are times when, you know, we just simply cannot hide from God. Now we go to the second one, and uh, we find out that it's Peter. And the truth is, there is no escape from self. It's interesting with, with Peter, we, we learned that uh, this is another one of God's truths. Jesus told Peter that he would deny him three times. And Peter, in his arrogance, said, Lord, that would never happen. And yet we know the story. We find it in Matthew, the 26th chapter, and they're reading in, beginning with verse 73. After a little while, while uh, those standing uh, there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent uh, gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a, ro a rooster crowed, then Peter remembered the word of Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And get this. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Peter's pride just got in his way with so many of us. The truth is, we're just not always as strong as we think we are. And Jesus was trying to get uh, Peter to see that he needed God's strength during this testing time. We all do. Once again, we read those words, and he went outside and wept bitterly. Have you ever done something really wrong? Have you ever, ever done something very uh, embarrassing? It gives new meaning to the commercial, say, you want to get away? Do You want to crawl into a hole or, or something because you wish that you could be anybody but yourself. And one of the things that we have to understand is when we sin, we realize in us that there are consequences and, and the things that we go through. No matter how bad you feel, you cannot escape from self. Now, you know, there's a lot of people who like to do that. Just think if we could do that for a moment. Just think if uh, uh, we could zoop into somebody else's life and they could zoop into our body. Wouldn't that be something? You know, in China, they have what's called a social score. And you get better privileges if you have a high social score. So think of, P, uh, of uh, uh, you know, an angel coming down and, and talk, talking and, and saying to a person, guess what? You have a good spiritual score. You, you know, what would you like? I'd like to be in Bob's body and he had mine. And said, okay, we'll do that. Zoop, zoop, you know. And they say, well, what do you, Bob doesn't like it, but you, how do you like it? Well, I'm 75 pounds, you know, less. You know, this is really great. So the angel comes back a, a week later and says, well, uh, and he says, well, you know, Bob's broke. You, you know, I, I want to be in Joe's body. Joe's thin and he wears suits all the time and everything like that. And uh, so, okay, zoop, zoop, you know, and then, and then how do you like it? Well, Joe's got $500,000 in the bank. This is good. We go another week. But, you know, when you're not satisfied with yourself, no matter who you body that you would go into, you would not be satisfied. And after another week, he was bored again and wanted to be in another body. And, and the angel said, well, you only get three. And he said, well, you know that I've been so good. Why don't you give me what I deserve? And he said, okay, you wake up tomorrow, go to the mirror, and you will be that person that you deserve. He rushes to the mirror and looks. He says, wow, I was a guy. Now I'm a girl. What do I do now? Can you imagine? We are so messed up. Can you imagine? We can't even take care of our own body and our own problems, let alone zooping into somebody else's body, and they're zooping up into our mind. We would be so confused, and we are today. You cannot escape from yourself. No matter what happens, no matter how great the sin, no matter how difficult the situation, we've got to learn to live through it.
You know, sometimes we sin and we have great guilt and great grief. Uh, but we have to go to Jesus and we have to tell him that, uh, ask for forgiveness. And when we do, God has a gift of great grace. Uh, and he can renew us like he did with David uh, and Bathsheba situation or with Peter. And Peter worked through this. Uh, and he became a very strong apostle, meaning that he was given the keys to the kingdom. And what happened? He was able to open the door to the to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. Uh, later he preached and he was the one that opened the door to the Samaritans. And then he preached and he opened the door to the Gentiles. Uh, and Peter became a stellar example, strong and true of the Lord. We realize that we cannot escape from self. We can never let failure get the best of us. Okay, we're coming now, we're halfway through the sermon today and we're coming through the next one and folks, I'm just getting started. You know, so uh, we got two more to go and if you haven't already, you might want to clip on your uh, seatbelt and, and uh, listen up and sharpen up your pencil because these next two are really important. So the next one, we go is the rich fool. The truth is, there is no escape from death. Uh, people have tried to deny death. People have tried to escape death. God's truth tells us that death is real, that it could happen at any time and many people try to put death out of their mind they occupy their mind with the things of this world so we listen to one of Jesus parables and he says in Luke the 12th chapter and he told them this parable the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop he thought to himself what shall I do I have no place to store my crops. Uh, then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all of my grain and my goods. And I will say to myself, uh, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself. And then he concludes by saying, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. When we take a look at this particular life, this man had a bumper. And uh, I, my first uh, church was right there in the middle of the farmland of uh, uh, Illinois and uh, I could see there that there were times that uh, the, the, the bins and everything were overflowing and this man had the opportunity to help so many people. So many people were poor. He could have uh, gone ahead and helped people have a bread factory or whatever he needed and he could have given and given and given but the thing that got to him was the fact he stored everything up to himself he was not rich for God he was not prepared to die you know when I think of death uh, y you know I I, I kind of realize that uh, when you're younger in which I was when I was younger and uh, it seemed like death was a long way away you know I'll, I'll live forever now that I'm in my 70s, and uh, those are in the 70s and 80s, uh, you get up and you got these aches and pains and you can't remember what day it is, and there's a few other things. You realize uh, that death will probably come sooner than it will later. And uh, we realize that unless Jesus comes again, death awaits all of us. Everyone will die unless Jesus Christ comes again. Many have tried to cheat death uh, by finding things like the fountain of youth. Uh, there are some that cryogenics, they freeze themselves, must get awful cold when they do that. And later when science is there, they're going to come back to life. They're probably alive, but they're brain freezing, you know, and things of that nature. There are people that are searching for an elixir that will help them to find eternity. But contrary to popular belief, Jack Daniel is not that elixir. We realize and understand that death is going to knock at our door and death should never catch the Christian by surprise. God does not want us to erase him out. We can get so caught up with materialism, with the things of this world, with the abundance of things that we forget about God. The truth is God is 
now giving us the chance to be rich toward him. And how important that is. Now is the time that we must do all we can to please him and to surrender to his truth. Now we come to the last one, and that is Lazarus. The truth is, there is no escape from eternity. Um, this is our last truth for the day. There's no escape from eternity. It has been put that eternity is very, 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 very long. Life is short. Eternity is long. Eternity is long, but life is very short. What you do between those two uh, things that are on the uh, tombstone, your birth and your death, will determine where you'll be spending your eternity. Time will be no more. Jesus tells the story of a rich man who did not surrender to God uh, truth when it came to eternity. Now let's take a look at this. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate he was laid a, uh, a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell. There he was in torment and he looked up and saw Abraham at Lazarus' side. At this point, he asked Abraham if he had permission if uh, uh, Lazarus would comfort him by some water. And Abraham told him this could not be done. He explained that there were eternal barriers. Now, one of the things that we need to understand is there was the place of the dead, the Hades, the shield, and uh, there was uh, the place of torment or hell, and there was Abraham's bosom. And when people died in the Old Testament, now this is kind of my thought and my take on this, but I think it's probably right. The priest would once a year go into uh, the temple or uh, the tabernacle and offer a sin offering, but since the blood of goats and bulls could not forgive people's sin, that sin was rolled back. Well, these people died under the law. Jesus had not been crucified yet, so their sins could not be forgiven. So there was this holding place in Abraham's bosom. And I believe that when Jesus died, that he went there. And he preached to those people. And then sometime, maybe at ascension, whatever, they went up with him to be at heaven because Paul says when he, when he died that he would be with the Lord. And from that point on, everything is up instead of everything down. And so here we are, a glimpse of eternity, a glimpse of Hades, a glimpse of hell, a glimpse of Abraham's bosom, a glimpse of a place where there's torment, a, a glimpse where there's abundance, uh, and he tells him that uh, nothing can be done. On earth, Satan does all that he can to minimize our eternity. He whispers and says that our eternity is a long way off. Don't be concerned. He also whispers that there's no such place as hell. Satan's primary weapon is the lie, and our primary defense is the truth. Uh, dealing with Satan is not a power encounter. It must be a truth encounter. Satan's lie cannot withstand the truth, as darkness cannot uh, be over, uh, continue with light. When you die, eternity is set. No matter how much you want to repent, no matter how much sorry you are, it doesn't make any difference. You die and you have your eternity. There are many people today that don't believe in, in eternity. They believe that there is no God and they believe in evolution. Some people, the modern people, think that aliens seeded the world and, and uh, you know, with uh, DNA and that's how. And there are many people that... Uh, uh, just don't believe, uh, they believe uh, maybe in God, but once they die, that's it. They're done. There won't be any punishment, you know. But the Bible, when we go to the Bible and we see the truth of God, we see that eternity is a very, very uh, great reality. And uh, there's probably many people uh, who need to understand, like in Hebrews 9.27, is appointed for man to die, but after this, the judgment. Many people want to be like the rich man when living and Lazarus when they die.
The Bible teaches us it doesn't work that way. We must prepare for eternity now. It was meant for us to be with God and Jesus for all eternity. We must surrender to that truth. There's a poem that says, the stars shine over the earth, the stars shine over the sea, the stars look up to the mighty God, the stars look down on me. The stars have lived for thousands of years, a thousand years in a day, but God and I shall love and live when the stars have passed away. I'd like to close with two illustrations. There once was a man who had not accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. The man had plenty of opportunity. The minister visited him and he talked to him and he became ill, very serious. And uh, the uh, minister tried to convince him to accept Christ as a savior. And he said, if I get better, I will. Well, he got better. Time had passed, and he did not uh, do what he said he would do. And he became sick again, and the minister came and tried to get him to make good on his promise. And the man said, it's no use. It's too late now. I made my promise to Christ, and I broke it. The dying man whispered his last words, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and I am not saved. Soon he is gone to an eternity without God, without hope. The saddest thing is for one to come to that hour of Christ without hope and plunge into a Christless eternity. There was a second man who was a Christian, and he was about to die. In his last minutes, he called his family in. He asked one of his sons to read the 14th chapter, the Gospel of John. And he told each of them goodbye, and he loved them. And then he said, heaven is opening up, and the angels are coming down to carry me home. Oh, it's a wonderful to come to the end of your way with the hope and assurance that only Jesus can give. The cross and the empty tomb stand as a pivot point. People will either accept or reject that. And then they seal their eternity. We now come to the decision, what do you do with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? will determine where you will spend your eternity. God and Christ have done all they can. The rest is up to you. As we come to our hymn of invitation today, we've seen men struggling with the truth. And we have seen that the truth of God is always very real. It is trustworthy and true. Maybe you're outside of Christ and maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior through faith, repentance, confession, being baptized at water graves of baptism to rise to newness of life. Salvation can be yours today. Maybe uh, you just need to make a decision in your pew. You've wandered a little farther away from God than you thought you should. And so today we come, this could be a decision that's made in your pew. Maybe you have questions of how to become a member of the church. Some of our men here, uh, our ladies, could help you with that decision. So let us stand, uh, and uh, if you want to come forward with your decision, you can as we sing our hymn of invitation. <laughs>